It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming uh, on such a short notice. And, uh, and the way I, I like to talk about the projects, um, um, I normally try to think of a theme that works uh, with a little bit of what was happening at some point. And uh, I had a past lecture called over uh, uh, contagious risk because of the swine flu and everything that came out and it had to do about collaborative spirit. And um, this one um, is called overstimulation. Uh, we're a firm from Mexico City, based in Mexico City, but I studied architecture uh, not thinking that I was gonna be an architect in Mexico City. I studied architecture to be an architect wherever I was put at the time and the place and understand the conditions and, and try to understand and figure out how to be creative enough. Um, so uh, I think we can uh, lower the lights down a little bit, thanks. And um, yeah, I think that's good. Thanks. So the lecture is divided into three chapters. This is chapter one: a wonderful world of chaos, generation flux. I was bound up in a straitjacket and McGulliver was strapped to a headrest with like wires running away from it. Then they clamped like lidlocks on the eyes so that I could not shut them, no matter how hard I tried. The bankruptcy of the U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers. I've seen now what I've never seen before. What do we see? George Seemel in the Metropolis of Mental and Mental Life, he described or tried to describe, well, described really, uh, the, that overstimulation was a little bit uh, of uh, these rapid consuming images that really stressed, um, stressed the mind and uh, it was a little bit easier to consume the had the, the regular images or the regular circumstances. So a little bit dealing with the idea that when we jump from one thing to another and you're overstimulated, you don't go deep enough. Uh, intensification of the emotional life due to the swift and continuous shift of external and internal stimuli. But that leads us to stimulus and that something arouses or incites to activity. And what do I see or what do you see? Asking me that question, when we started working, this is a house that we built in 2001, and I started seeing tectonics at the beginning. 2001, I was interested in uh, concrete, stone, glass, uh, things that were light, things that were heavy. I started seeing um, these interstitial spaces or in this residential apartment building that we built in Mexico that I was more interested in the space where people would get together than actually the apartments on the inside. This is an atrium from the uh, upper level looking down to the lobby, and the glass bridges where everybody would kind of um, um, come together and say hello. Uh, I was interested in how to build things, and uh, I was interested in not only uh, understanding what was out there in the, in the uh, building industry, but knowing that whenever I wanted to do something or experiment with architecture, that I could uh, look for other media uh, or other places to get the results that I wanted. Uh, as the PR house that we also did in 2001, where we brought in some uh, uh, people that worked in, in Mexico City in, in car wrecked areas, uh, or, or when you would crash or bump your car, you would take it there that was cheaper than any other place uh, than, rather than the company, uh, the car company, uh, and, and fix it. And I brought people in to do this house, and we got a better result than the contractor who. Uh, he bragged that he was really good with steel and did not do a good work, a uh, good job. So uh, we got it um, uh, for a less price. So I was interested in, in figuring out these type of things. I was also interested in not specializing in any particular field. 
Uh, I found out uh, soon through music, as Antonio was, was saying before, that um, everybody started really being obsessive about what type of music you played, and that kept on happening in architecture. What type of architecture do you do? Are you a residential architect? Are you a corporate architect? Are you a, uh, so I said, well, I'm an architect, I design, and I don't care if it's a public, private building, um, and I know how to bring in the best people uh, in a team <clears throat> to have the best results. Uh, I understood architecture also as politics. This is a competition for the Bicentennial Arch that we did in Mexico City, and it was a criticism to the president um, because we did not agree that we needed to do a competition, an architectural competition for Bicentennial Arch. Um, so uh, we thought we needed more social housing, we needed to expand public spaces and have more open spaces, so uh, we proposed some futuristic social housing on top of a park that extended through Chapultepec. Um, obviously the project was mediatized, uh, it was, all the texts were cut out and uh, they just said that we had presented a post-apocalyptic nuclear frog. <laughs> um, uh, what else do we see? We see um, that architecture that's not able to give something back uh, might not be doing uh, the right job. Uh, we were asked to do a project uh, for Nestle, the company, and um, we were asked to do actually a tunnel or a bridge on the inside of a factory for kids to come in and witness the production of chocolate. Uh, when we heard the brief and we went to the site, uh, I remember feeling a bit depressed when I took a 40-minute ride uh, from Mexico City to Toluca. And, um, and getting to, well, seeing generic factory after generic factory and then coming to Nestle and imagining kids traveling in a school bus, <laughs> going to see, the, the, I don't know if they would expect Willy Wonka or who uh, to open the door of the chocolate factory, but it was really, really hard and, and depressing. So we started doing a little bit of research and we found out that there was no chocolate museum in Mexico, which was ironic because, of course, as we know, Aztecs were using chocolate as a, a currency and then it was taken away by the Spaniards and brought back a hundred years later as we know it. But not having a chocolate museum in Mexico was kind of weird. Uh, we convinced them to do a chocolate museum as an added value to the project where, of course, if the company wanted to brand the company for kids going to see the factory, I didn't mind about that, but I would mind if they were not giving something else in return. So we convinced them and we did this chocolate museum that's open to the public. Um, and it's been very successful. It's, it, it receives almost 43,000 kids per year uh, from Mexico. Um, we built it in two and a half months. That was also one of the crazy things. As I always say in Mexico, it doesn't matter if you have a contract signed, it doesn't matter. Uh, the only way you know that things are really happening is because everybody's in a hurry and everybody needs to speed things up. So um, most of the staff went on site. We were actually working three hour shifts with the people uh, there doing a one to one <laughs> scale model. Um, but then after all this uh, input that we get every day with the media, with everything happening around us, um, this is chapter two called selection, uh, selective sampling. So with all the input, what is the output? Which is more stimulating? We can argue about that, no? <laughs> uh, and just uh, quoting a little bit of Jacob von Weskel, um, and how he talks about the environment or surrounding world. And he says, we build our own environment context from what makes sense to us, what stimulates us correctly. There does not exist a forest as an objectively fixed environment. There exists a forest for the park ranger, a forest for the hunter, a forest for the botanist, a forest for the nature lover, and a forest for the carpenter. Every environment is, closed, is a closed unity in itself which results from the selective sampling of a series of elements and a series of marks. So more and more we figured out in the office that in order to be really reactive, as I like to call it in architecture, every uh, building, every room, every situation. You all structure. remember this movie, I'm Spy Games? I'm also checking the room, memorizing the people, what they're wearing. Then I ask the question, what's wrong with this picture? Do you think suspect? You gotta see it, assess it, and dismiss most of it without looking, without thinking. Without thinking, it's just like breathing. You breathe, don't you? Suit in the kitchen. Threat? Wait, how'd you see that? Guy in the gray sweater. Gray sweater. Gray sweater? Gray sweater. Don't forget what's right in front of you. So don't forget what's right in front of you. 
this idea, um, and maybe it has to do a lot of coming from Mexico City, a place that uh, there's so much chaos going on. Uh, I always say that we've always been in crisis when people start freaking out about, oh, the economical crisis and the world crisis. And Latin American countries, we tend to always adapt or react or try to figure out how to work things out, but that, that's a constant condition. So this thing about it, being aware or being reactive and and it, it, it starts from even walking down the street that you're almost run over by a public transportation system or now that we have the bicycles in Mexico and people are starting to use bicycles, I always say it's uh, the number one extreme sport in the world if you want to come over and experience a thrill and some adrenaline. Um, so this idea of, uh, uh, of we call it adaptive diagnostic design where we, when the client comes in and asks for a project, and it's happened over and over. The client normally, he has an idea of the program he wants. Of course, it's easier sometimes in a house, but uh, they're always changing their minds. So the program keeps on evolving or changing, and then the client doesn't want to um, uh, pay the changes of the project, and it's a constant struggle, which we found out that we needed to do something first, and we called it adaptive diagnostic design, where we, we walk with the client, we do a bit of a charrette, and then together we come up with a program that he signs, and of course, he, in theory, he doesn't, uh, he's not going to change it. Um, but in a way of, of understanding what's the best outcome of the project, and I'm not talking about the functional part. Uh, I, I guess I'm tired a little bit of talking about the functionality of a project, and because if we're not able to, to design a project that works in the best way possible function-wise and solves a problem uh, or a program, I think we're not even uh, at the right place to start with, so we forget we should forget about architecture. But today I think it is what happens out of the architecture that we're working with. What happens with that function? What happens with the program? How does it relate and how does it change something? How does it really create a dialogue? Um, this is a project that we started working with another client, and um, I use Spy versus Spy, because uh, understanding the situation, um, it's one of the most important companies, retail companies in Mexico, uh, it's called Liverpool, and they always uh, uh, get to be in the, every time there's a shopping mall, there's two anchor stores, Palacio de Hierro and Liverpool. And because these two guys are always fighting, that to us was kind of an opportunity to jump in and say, okay, you guys are always uh, uh, fighting about who has the best products, the best uh, um, uh, projection, the best marketing. And we saw it as an opportunity. Of course, this is not our facade. This is what they presented to us. And they said, well, this is what we're going to build. So when we did some studies with them and we figure out the opportunity, this sits in an area called Interlomas, which is the suburb inside a suburb inside a suburb in Mexico, which of course lacks public transportation and it lacks um, um, any uh, open space, any, uh, I mean here, uh, this render looks like you have some trees over there, but there, there are no trees. This is already all fully built. The sidewalks are barely a meter. Um, so we started working, on, on, uh, working with them on the facade. The condition was that the store had already um, had the layouts worked with a FRCH, a company in, in, in Cincinnati, and it had the storage space all on the perimeter, so we could not even have a dialogue or perforate the facade. Um, we did our first project that, um, that we um, digitally, digitally designed but had fabricated in the States because um, you'll see in some other projects that was more of the typical condition that we would digitally design but local fabricate and understand the conditions of, for instance, the Nestle project that we were working on site with the iron workers and explaining 3D models and 3D drawings and, and, and physical models for um, uh, to have the, the, um, the understanding and get it built. This is the first project that we could send the 3D model to Zaner Metals in Kansas City with Bill Zaner and his team, which are great at doing steel. And we had more than 8,500 um, uh, independent pieces, something that it's also really uh, incredible to, um, uh, to do because, of course, coming from the first projects that we did, that you had to have the perfect module repeating itself in order to be inexpensive. And now uh, that you can fabricate different pieces and still get the same, um, uh, well, get a really great result and a really good budget and have different pieces. This is the outcome of the project. This is a stainless steel facade. And uh, talking about this added value, uh, we could have shut, just shut up and uh, listen to the client just wanting for a facade, but we didn't. We kind of acted as an advisor with this uh, diagnosis that we did for him, and we proposed that because there was no public space, we, that we should do a park on top of the building. And while we were doing a park, that we should also think about having some type of program. So we put 
a restaurant on top and uh, immediately when we put the restaurant they they saw it as a branding opportunity so they created their own gour gourmet area and so now they do pizzas and sushi and all different types of, of food for the upstairs part of the building and that got us also to extend the contract and get a contract for the um, the center core of the building and the, the atrium on top uh, these are the uh, these were assembled in Mexico by a company. It took us nine months to uh, build the project. Even when we were talking to, with uh, the people from Zaner, they thought we were kidding. They said, nah, well, this normally takes almost four years or three years maybe if we push a little bit, but uh, it's not true that you guys are gonna have it built in nine months. And we did get it built in nine months. Uh, another thing that we needed to do is when we put together teams, we try to figure out, we try to do a design value engineer before doing the, the value engineer that just chops up the project. So even in, this, in the design sense, um, we were talking with Zainer not for them to fabricate, but not to come down to Mexico and ensemble because it would have been really expensive. Uh, it was hard at the beginning, uh, but then they said, okay, if I know the guy who's gonna ensemble it in Mexico, it, it'll be okay. Um, after they finished it in nine months, now they wanna hire the Mexican company <laughs> to work with them. Um, and the facade normally, it, it reacts really to the overpasses and underpasses and all this kind of urban crazy condition that you, you always get to see the project in a, in a really fast speed. You normally don't get to see it uh, walking. I mean, I don't know if you can barely see a sidewalk there, but as I, as I explained, it's not even one meter. This is the condition. As you see, everything happening around here, all the small houses, this big uh, hospital around there. And this is a little bit of the composition and how we started from the facade, then getting in, into the building, uh, even changing the, stair, the, the escalators, which they're normally very neurotic about having the escalators in the very precise position. And we said, well, why don't we start uh, taking uh, or having fun with the escalators and make it an experience of movement. If the, uh, if the outside facade responds to speed and cars, why not the inside would respond to the people walking up or down the escalators? Um, so this is one of the views from, from the ground looking up, which uh, uh, has become a very interesting place where everybody, you see a lot of people taking pictures around there. And um, one of the, the, the most important things about this project is that at the end, um, or as somebody or a good friend of, uh, of ours and a consultant said, you guys are making companies earn a bit more money because uh, they gave us a report that because of the garden on top and the restaurant, now the, the, the restaurant it brings 30% of all the income of the store rather than the store being the, 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 the ones uh, uh, providing the income. And it also changed the store hours that were from nine to nine. Now on weekends, they open up the park uh, with an independent elevator and it closes at 2 a.m. So this consultant friend of ours was saying, well, you're doing a business strategy for these guys and then designing a building, but you're getting really excited about doing a building just because you're proving to them that they can do things that design will make the building better. So we're still learning that process also. Uh, these are some of the images of uh, well, some videos of the construction and, and people um, and the process. And um, this is a video that the, the company at, the, at some point, which they had worked with a lot of architects, but they, they, have never, they had never opened a building with their architect there. They would not give too much about architecture. And it's the first time that when we um, were at the opening of the store, we were invited. They asked us to do this video so they can promote it um, or, or put it on the internet, on their own internet that talked about their people and the process of this project in particular. Now we have a really good relationship with these clients and we're working on two more projects that I'll show you one um, in, in, a, in a bit. This is a, one of the most uh, significant projects that talk about the digital design but the local fabrication. This is um, a Toritori restaurant, a Japanese restaurant that I, we're, at, we're actually here also competing uh, for the uh, Azure Awards. Uh, this is nominated for one of the best restaurants. and. Um, the interesting thing is that we, we knew what we wanted to do. It was one of the 
it's a great Japanese restaurant, but at the beginning, the guy, uh, the owner of the restaurant, he was talking about kois and ponds and the fish and everything. And, and I was looking at him because he's been in Mexico for more than 25 years. He's been divorced four times. Now he has a 25-year-old girlfriend. And uh, I was telling him, well, you, but you're more contemporary than the traditional things that you want for your restaurant. So why don't we sit down and really uh, kind of talk about what Japanese restaurant you want? Uh, again, kind of this diagnostic where we sit down and we try to uh, make them understand that we can play with the facade and do some um, uh, elements that kind of talked about uh, liquid spaces or fluidity. Um, and it's a refurbishment of an existing house that we cleaned up the house. And then uh, uh, we opened up the spaces, we customized, well, we brought in a team of experts, uh, some really good friends, uh, Hector Esraue, who's a great industrial designer. He customized every piece of furniture, the landscape designer, the lighting designer. But um, in the sense of production or fabricating, uh, we could not afford to have thick plates. So we went with really thin gauge steel. Um, and then what we started doing is creating boxes and welding it in the middle uh, piece by piece, and then putting it together, there were almost 45 workers uh, welding every piece of the, uh, of the facade. Once we had the boxes, they would spray foam on the inside, so you have lightweight uh, uh, structure, and it would not sound hollow if you, if you touched it or knocked on it. Um, this is the final result of the building. Also something that interesting that happens is uh, you have the glass, we opened up the windows to make them bigger, floor to ceiling, but you have sliding doors, this is not working well, but uh, that you slide back so they tend to, to disappear in the facade. And, uh, and when you're on, on the inside, of obviously the natural, uh, uh, you have natural ventilation, which is really great. At nighttime, we, we play with, um, we have some LEDs uh, to play with, and then you have a natural vertical wall. Some of the details, even on the inside of the staircase, not even touching the ground, so it kind of floats a little bit to give you a sensation of, of um, a very lightweight. This is, uh, so from, from the inside, what I was saying is that all the glass parishions go back uh, outside of this wall. All the custom-made furniture, as you can see here, even the bathrooms. And this is uh, the, the tea room, which was an unexpected um, uh, space that when we were uh, restructuring the house, uh, we found out that we could do something in that particular space, which is great because you're compressed at 220, and then it just opens up and it has a a skylight a little bit with a James Terrell effect with a green vertical wall on the back and the sunken boots so you can sit down and have a, um, a nice um, dinner, romantic dinner. <laughs> That's also the, uh, some of the furniture that was done for the place. And it's been very well uh, received in Mexico. The, the, the restaurant had been open for, uh, it, had, it has another place that's been open for 15 years. And, uh, but now that they have this new, um, this new space, this, is, this gets uh, really packed. People like coming into the, 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 the space. This is a, a high rise that we hadn't talked about and we hadn't presented it. This is in, in Morelia, Michoacan. And, uh, one of the uh, interesting things about this project in particular is that uh, by studying typologies and trying to separate a building or a traditional building into a triangular shape and then breaking it up in three pieces um, and having the different components embedded, uh, mixed use, we convinced the client to have a cultural public space in the middle of the building. Um, and he agreed uh, not only um, to have a, a public space, it's a cultural center, so he wants, uh, he, uh, wants to show his art collection. There's three cinemas uh, in there, and it has, of course, an independent uh, elevator going up to the, the, the cultural part. Also trying to bring the green uh, of the landscape onto, uh, into the tower, so each of the units uh, or the elements of the tower has an independent core where you go out, and this is, you have natural ventilation um, to the building. And there's a, uh, sorry that you can't see it very well, but there's, you have a, 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 an opening in the middle that goes all the way down. Of course, everything is capped by the, the cultural center, so it doesn't rain on the, on the inside, but you can look all the way through the floors. And then when the, when the cultural center stops, you get an independent um, uh, penthouses, you get a hotel, and you get a, um, a private office. This is a little bit of the video of the place in Morelia. And, um, 
And uh, the interesting thing is that most of the clients that we're getting now, when we start working with them in this uh, diagnostic design that we talk about, uh, they really get engaged into the design process. And what's really interesting is that at some point, it's the, it becomes their idea. No, when we start talking about the, uh, that, what, which is the added value, which of course they can make money uh, with a regular tower and, and how they can add uh, um, extra elements and also be proud of the things that we're doing. No? I think uh, to all of us, this economical crisis, I think it, what, that's one of the things that we question a lot. No? What are we um, working on and, and what's the, the whole effort worth? No? Uh, the whole tower is uh, compromised. It, it, the, the outer skin is made of precast elements, prefabricated concrete elements uh, with the different colors of earth um, or, or ground colors. Um, like when you, you're doing a cut in a mountain that you could see the, all the, the different uh, tones of, of, um, of brown or dark brown. And then it has all the glass on the inside. That's a, a little bit of the cultural uh, space. This is going under construction. In it starts in February next year. And that's one of the views from the from underneath. And the idea is also to kind of blur the edges. No, so all these precast con concrete uh, slabs start pu pulling in and out and kind of hide the glass behind it. You, of course, you have a great view because of, but because of the height and the angle that you, you will be looking at the building, it kind of looks more of a, of a uh, heavier building rather than uh, an open building. This is a new building that we're doing for the same company as I showed you, Liverpool. And uh, out of the maybe, or not maybe, but um, uh, out of the frustration of the first uh, project that we did that we cannot perforate the facade, and also the frustration that if they're doing stores, why do they put the storage on the perimeter? If maybe the, the interesting thing would be to put, uh, pour everything towards the outside and have uh, the store exposed and, and, and have a relation to the street. So uh, on a new project that they're doing, that which is an, uh, an extension to an additional um, uh, store that they already had, we propose to have an inhabitable facade, uh, a 280 meter uh, uh, depth facade where actually instead of having the mannequins you would have the people inside the store coming out, uh, maybe having a cup of coffee in the, in the restaurant or maybe trying on some shoes or having some different activities but would be exposed to the facade in a way that it would be, um, well, why not sexy, no? but the idea that it would be interesting enough not to uh, not only to see a, a, a graphic facade, but rather than an inhabitable facade. So we chose which were the right programs or components to uh, start working. There's, a, there's even a slide for kids. So you see kids sliding on the facade uh, also. And, uh, and we presented it to the client. And again, I, I think it's, it's a right moment where, I, where, I, where we've, we've, had, we've been having this experience where clients want to be pushed a little bit. No? So when we just give them a slight push, again, it becomes their idea, and now they're fascinated with the idea. And of course, um, nothing could be better than a client thinking it's his idea, wanting to finish the project as, as it was talked about or intended. Um, some of the models and physical studies that we were doing, there's places with trees, there's uh, some of the glasses flushed back so you can see the depth, but there's actually three layers uh, coming into play. And I think this is also, uh, I, I think a, a little bit of the frustration of the first project we did, but also frustration of seeing all these graphic facades that nothing happens really, but it's, it's a bit graphical. Maybe even in the restaurant, when we, when we were seeing kids kind of climbing the facade of the Japanese restaurant, it was kind of interesting to see what happens if you can inhabit the, the space in between. Uh, another company that we were working with and pushing a little bit the envelope, uh, Chedrawi is a company where you would buy groceries, no? Um, so we did this video intentionally to show them the, the potential of the store and how to uh, be on top of the market no? and, and, and reposition the company as an educational company uh, rather than just a, a selling company, and, uh, which already sells really good quality project, uh, products and it has a great service. But um, what happens if we can do more? What happens if the experience continues? So what we're proposing is to have a a new urban uh, concept on the rooftop, which of course they didn't ask for. And uh, what happens if the, if the companies uh, providing uh, uh, products would work on, top, on, on an existing rooftop or harvesting field and um, reinforce the concept of farm to fork? So the companies would teach kids and, and family members on top about harvesting as we know today that a lot of schools 
um, for kids are, are bringing the, the harvesting concept back so they know where food comes from because that was really, I think, a, a terrifying moment when they were asking kids where food came from and they were answering cans and bags instead of where they were actually coming from. Um, so by making them understand and see the potential of or the opportunity of the moment, they agreed to the project. And um, instead of just having a project that would be the typical store on the, on, uh, on the first level and then a parking lot connected to the street, uh, we managed to do this whole rooftop with these um, canvases on top and the harvesting areas and public park. And now they're uh, adding a, a coffee uh, area also. This is a little bit of the type of work that we do where... Um, Again, we could have stayed with uh, just designing a regular store and doing a regular layout. Um, some of the diagrams that we used to explain for the client what happens, uh, because at some point one of the, the, the questions was that they didn't want to pay. If, if this was not uh, permeable, uh, they would charge them additional amount of square meters. So we, we did a system, of course, that, uh, that it, it rains on top of the parking in these decked areas. And um, this is one of the projects that we're working on now that needs to be opened by the end of the year, specifically November, because our president leaves term. And uh, this is a government project, one of the most important cultural ones. Uh, the National Film Institute uh, that already existed, the Cineteca Nacional. We were invited to do an addition to the project. And uh, of course, we did our checklist. And when they said we need four new cinemas, we said, OK, four new cinemas. We need some vaults. OK, we have the vaults. Uh, but then, of course, in, in that question of what more can we add, uh, when people would visit Cineteca, it's four, four volumes in the back with an open courtyard there, they would think that the public space of the, of the film institute was inside these buildings. Of course, when they were walking on top of these, this plank with cars, that's the experience that, that you would get. So the first thing that we challenged was, what if we take the cars out? What if we do a building to just stack the cars on the front of the, of the lot? And when people enter, now we have a park. So now it's a film institute that you walk around the park. You really have the experience of being on the outdoors. And then you choose which cinema to go to. And uh, so this was the actual state of the, of the, of the place. That's what I was explaining. This was what everybody knew about the, oh, the uh, public space. And then this that were the vaults in the back, these elements there. Uh, people didn't even know they existed. Nobody knew about the cultural um, uh, meaning of having all the archive of the film, um, uh, the Mexican film archive there, plus all the film that was, uh, had been donated to the uh, National uh, Film Institute. So we said, what if we take out the parking lot and we convert everything into a park? So the actual condition and what they would get by having a, a parking lot here, when you enter, then you would have the whole parking. And then by obviously reinforcing there's an entrance here and then an entrance here. So you would have the two axes uh, actually working in favor of the original building that existed there and we'd create a canopy that covers the center space uh, in a way that um, you're covered, uh, of course, of the weather conditions, but you let light in. Uh, we have more trees, we have more parking. And this is the, the idea of, the, of the, this rooftop of the four new cinemas with, with ramps going up, with some atrium spa some uh, um, mezzanine spaces here, and then this cantilevers over the existing uh, elements. It's a steel structure with a 150 meter depth uh, steel that on the edges goes down to 20 centimeters. So when you see it frontal wise while, by coming in the park, it's a very lightweight element with glass on top, as I was explaining. Uh, this is viewing to the other side. This is the relationship of the new uh, element uh, going over the cinema, the, the old cinemas, of course, it touches at some point, and it just, uh, you ha we have some steel plates so it, um, it's, uh, it can slide uh, uh, in case of movement and, um, um, for our quake, earthquake conditions in Mexico. And then the park outside, this is uh, the day it was presented, and uh, the video that it kind of explains to you how, um, how it works and how it's seen. Uh, we had uh, two months to present, uh, well, we presented three options for the Ministry of Culture in Mexico, and uh, we got it approved, and it's nine months uh, for construction of the, of the project. We're doing, we're doing well. <laughs> we, we will finish on time. We need to. 
Otherwise, I think we'll come over and live in Toronto if we don't finish on time. <laughs> or somewhere else. <laughs> no, nah, but uh, it, it needs to be finished on time. So a little bit of the idea of the ramps, the sequence, the, the, the rooftop on the, on the bottom part, this, this is a shiny aluminum in, in white, and the idea is the reflections of the everyday life. Now, if we talk about moving images that compose a, a, a film, the idea now is that these images also reflect, or another screen that reflects the daily life. This is the building, the parking lot building, that creates a really interesting entrance, and then you're open to the garden. We created additional you know, library space, cafeterias. And then of course with the conditions that we have in Mexico, climate conditions, uh, we could not have forgotten uh, having outdoor cinemas. And now the, the whole experience is about having uh, uh, understanding that you have your cultural archive there, the new, the new cinemas, they're talking about a new museum also to be integrated in the space. And this is a, this is a place that, that really, uh, that 750,000 people go there a year. Uh, and a lot of people pass, uh, use it as a public park or a public pathway because you have a metro station close by. Um, and this, no, I mean, each of us has a different reaction to the different stimuli. And it's not about sensitivity, romantically speaking. It's about what we choose to call our attention. So when we're designing, it's about that. What really calls our attention? What do we want to really want to focus on? And the last chapter and the third chapter is adaptation. Uh, survival mode activated. And the idea of embracing instability. I know this is a word that we're often shocked with when somebody says, well, th there are unstable conditions because we're taught to be to work on things or to have things that kind of assure us that everything's going to be all right. But we've learned with time that a lot of things are not going to be all right. We start over our personal relations. We start over work. We start over, over and over and over. And it's crazy that we don't get used to this kind of starting over and being, and being okay you know, and being able to react. Um, and now, um, quoting Slodergic, a specific design task, no? the reintroduction of perception to the user and visible features of a project. And, and as architects, of course, we try to, uh, we make people concentrate either on the entrance or how they move around. But I think this is also a concept that where architecture, uh, if we keep on having the values of architecture as we did before, that architecture is this incredible building that's able to house all these elements and architectural uh, features and, and classic thinking. Uh, I think we're missing a lot of the part where, where we need to expect buildings to have to give back more uh, in many different conditions. No? So for instance, this, this lab that we were asked to do for Nestle as a second project, uh, is it an innovation lab or is it a public pavilion? because it's the first time that we took the scientists out of the basement and put them on, on ground level and being in contact with nature, um, which they're, of course, having a better performance and they're having a great time and they're very grateful that we uh, thought of that. Uh, it, was this just a skin or is it a park? Oops. When we did this competition for the Tamayo Museum in Mexico with Bjarke Ingels as a, as a partner, um, they were, uh, it was a competition for a museum, but we figured out that the museum was better to be called, uh, to open it up as a public uh, back of house. We opened up all the areas of the museum, the storage, the uh, documentation and everything, and we made that whole experience as a museum. So can we take advantage of the other conditions to really have a, a better architecture? Um, I'm gonna, well, I'm going to start. I'm going to show you. Uh, I put in these two examples because um, I always say that. Uh, let me see if I can stop it. Ah, oh, no. Well, anyway, it'll it'll, it'll pass. Uh, I, I say that the worst crisis is that way is is a crisis when you stop thinking, not the economical, not the uh, not the other type of crisis, but when your mind ceases to think. Uh, we created another company called Agent that uh, works parallel and in the same uh, space as Rojkin Arquitectos, uh, where we're, we're designing, um, um, uh, it's an industrial design uh, office where we did this soccer ball. Uh, we were rethinking why a soccer ball could not be 
uh, could not have air, so we did an airless soccer ball made with uh, polymers and elastomers, so it would bounce the same way, but would leave you the idea that you could see inside the soccer ball. It has a radio frequency chip on the inside, so if it goes out of bounds, it lights up and it tells the referee so he doesn't have to run after the players. If it goes in the soccer ball, again, it reacts. Um, so this is the type of stuff that we love to work on to have fun, and it's not that we're specialists in soccer balls, it's, it's that we're thinking with a different angle, we're thinking it with a different point of view, and what can a soccer ball provide just besides bouncing and, and being hit by a player, no? Um, it was, this came out about two and a half years ago, and it was, of course, rejected by the FIFA because they didn't want technology. Um, but it was in every blog, and it was really talked about every, th every time something happened in a game, they would have this in, in live games. Uh, we were also thinking about uh, doing luggage for contemporary travelers, no? because now you see uh, a single parent with his kid and the kid's wanting to play, so what happened if you would have a, a suitcase that would open up and you can take your kid and pull him or, or have a, um, your little kid or your, um, uh, sitting on top, or maybe spin around or use it as a trolley instead of buying or, uh, or paying for uh, to carry your luggage, or one for um, elder people or people with uh, back injuries or something, they could sit down in their own luggage. That We normally do that. If the, the, the queue is really long, we already sit down on our, um, uh, on our bag, so why not have one that's implemented specifically for that? So the idea of this company that we built uh, called Agent was focusing on all these other things that are out there that we tend to just grab because society told us that's the way they function or that's the way we're typically uh, expected to, um, uh, to take them in and use them, no? Uh, now we're working on cemeteries and uh, a lot of different other um, uh, programs and Rockin' Arquitectos along with Agent are uh, tied together um, uh, more than ever uh, in, in the provocative thoughts, no? And the diagnostic design as we, as we talked about. And just to wrap up, um, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, as we uh, know from Darwin, no? nor the most intelligent, but the ones that are, are adaptable to change. So this idea of adaptability. And um, just as a joke, because I, I, I lived in New York when I was five years old, and uh, my partner Jerry here sitting down in front of us is going to kill me because I, he always says that I, I cannot keep my mouth shut and not joke about it. <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass you, Jerry, don't worry. Uh, I learned the expression when I was five, from five to seven and a bit maybe older. Uh, what happens when you're on a date and you're going out with your girlfriend for the first time and you want to kiss and then you go back to your house and you start feeling pain and you don't know why. And you start experiencing, they, they told me that the name was called, sorry for that, but they were saying it's called uh, blue balls, and I said, what is blue balls? What are they talking about? Because I was translating in Spanish, and I would say, este, pelotas azules. So I would, I would not understand. Um, and I would, I would really, uh, this happens in my mind when you're thinking a lot of things, and you have all this input, and there's just no way of taking it out. Uh, I think you, we, would, we would have to call it having a blue brain, no? that you cannot let all these uh, the, the ideas or things flow outside your mind once you're have all this uh, input um, uh, or, or overstimulation. So it's not the amount of information we have, it's the amount of things that we want to bring out. Thank you very much. So I think we can do some questions and we're very fortunate tonight because Gerardo Salinas, also a partner with Michelle and, and Rotkin Arquitectos is, um, is here with us as well. So I have a mic if there's any questions popping up. Yeah, not about the, the, the blue part. <laughs> top 10, I think, for the uh, Mississauga Absolute Competition. I'm wondering if you have any other uh, proposals for uh, projects in the GTA. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Something, uh, no. Oh, I'll speak here. Something that, uh, something that, that was a bit interesting, not to say funny or curious, but uh, um, because I started as a musician, in Mexico, it took, me, it took them a while 
to really say, ah, he's our Mexican architect, no? So he was like, nah, he used to be a drummer. Let's not take this guy serious. And after a lot of things happened outside, including the, the, the competition here, uh, we were doing projects in Kuwait, competitions in Dubai, it, it got a lot of people's attention and, and I, I got really um, uh, good critics out, or good crits out of it. I was, started to have invitations as a, a professor, uh, to compet now as jury in some other competitions. And then suddenly I was wanted by my country, you know, so ah, he is an architect, and now we're invited even by the government to do a cultural project. So um, um, two years ago, I invited Jerry to join the office. Uh, we were very good friends. So Jerry moved with his wife and kids back to Mexico because he's Mexican, but he lived 16 years in the States. Take that for a cultural shock. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and we've been working hard uh, growing the office in Mexico. So no, we hadn't had any new opportunities. We lost a little bit of the coming back and forth. We had the, the charrette for the island airport and, and kind of this thinking that uh, we've been working now with Antonio and, and Dialogue uh, on some other projects, so I hope things can come out of uh, that, relation, no? the, that relationship. So if you know somebody, let me know now. <laughs> Michelle, what are, what are some of the things that are going on in Mexico City? I mean, you're, is your work a good example of a kind of avant-garde or a new architecture that's emerging in that city? Because I've been hearing that there is a lot of action in Mexico City, and the city, in fact, is improving immensely in the, as far as its public realm. It is changing. Of course, you have, um, you have a, architects that are even my generation that kept on doing maybe the things that previous generations were doing, and they do it really well. It's a very well-crafted architecture, it's very good, but it's very safe. And there's another generation that we're really looking for this kind of provocation, this disruptiveness. No? If, if it doesn't change anything, we kind of tend to feel, why do it? No? And you see it in, in film now. I mean, we just won, um, a, one of our best directors, a, a, um, just won a best director in, in Cannes in the, in the film festival. A, we have... Cuarón, González Iñarri, to these other uh, film directors. It's happening with contemporary art. It's happening with urban art that uh, in Mexico before having graffitis was kind of, ah, oh, it's a really bad area. So now you have graffiti artists and we just had the All City Canvas Festival in Mexico and it was incredible. The government was sponsoring it and private companies. Um, there, is, there is a need to come up with new ideas and refresh. It's so chaotic. It's, it's a really turbulent environment. It's, we, I call it the eight-headed monster, no? because it's, you can't define Mexico in one way. It depends on the area you are. It's that way, but then you move four blocks, and then it's another way. And it's, it, it's always there. It's always live. And it's kind of this thing where, as I was trying to explain, you're always walking with your antennas to their full potential because you'll get run over, you'll get mugged, uh, anything can happen. So you're aware. And that awareness not only works, of course, as a human being, as a survival mode in a, in a, in a country, it works in, the, in a sense where you sit down and you're really practical about the thinking of what do we do to improve, no? And it, so there is a, a, there is a lot of um, a, a interesting things happening. And I don't think only in Mexico, Latin America in general. I just came back from Colombia for, I was jury for the Biennale, and it's really amazing what these guys have done in Colombia, no? And, uh, and, and again, how the weight of architecture is changing, where it's not a, about the building anymore. It's what the building can do. And that, that, I think, is something about our time, and it's really important. And some other generations kind of feel uncomfortable, like, no, you can't talk about architecture that way. It still has to be important. It is important, of course. It solves a lot of different things. But... Uh, instead of talking about how much did it cost per square meter or what was the best project for the less amount of money, we should talk about what project for the less amount of money had the, be the best impact or the better impact. I think that's how the values are changing. No? While you were talking about the buildings, what intrigued me and what I wanted to know is like, how did that skin that you put on that, that, what does that feel like inside? And like, I can't imagine without any lighting, light coming through and that, just the material, like what did it feel like? And the, and the next question is, what's happening in Dubai? I thought things were um, not too good. The party was over in Dubai. Uh, in, in the stainless steel facade? Yes. 
there's nothing it's it's a floating facade there's nothing they already had done a semicircular building and we were called to do the facade so it's just the skin yeah 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 so uh, that, that's what, what i was saying uh, we tried to convince them to have openings they say no 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 no, no because you're going to ruin our, our storage space so uh, we insisted on a while uh, of having all these bands maybe one being a window they say we don't want to look towards the outside no we want people to come in and have the experience on the inside when we figured out it was kind of a lost battle we proposed the park on the top of the building where we said okay we'll stop or less we'll lose the commission but then we'll find another we'll, we'll choose another fight <laughs> and we chose to pick on the park on top of the building so there's no there's no evidence of the skin on the inside of the building which is kind of a, a it's sad i mean uh, but also and even thinking a little bit about generations uh, we tend to feel shy about saying oh it's just a skin we did the best skin we could and if we were called upon doing a skin we don't feel bad about it we feel that we did something that responded to the conditions of the cars and the overpasses and underpasses, which I think would have been a great job if it ended there. Of course, because of our nature, we didn't stop there. And we got the center core and we got the, do the skylight and then the park. And because they're earning more money because of the restaurant on top, now uh, we're pushing the company, as the other project we showed you, to have not only expose the store, but start having alliances with companies, for instance, in their um, sports area or department store. The idea is that they have a company that, work, they, that does gyms, working with them to have a small gym inside the store. Because we, we're trying to learn with them or grow with them, saying if you have a program, people will buy more. And the reason, that the, the reason of the income of the, part, the upper part of the store is not because there's a restaurant. It's because they feel really well eating there. And because, of course, when they get up, they grab the bottle of wine, they grab some stuff for their house, they pay it at the, at the register, and then they leave. So they're having the experience, but they're buying, and then they're leaving. So we're adding program to, to stuff that didn't happen before. Because, of course, if you would go to a, a department store, you, if you wanted to buy shoes, you would just go for the shoes, no? So we're trying to figure out what other components to bring in. And, and we're in a comfortable position, or, I, or, or I, as I like to say, I feel much better being the consultant of a client or the advisor than the architect. Because I, I've learned that if you're only the architect or the designer, then the client has the daughter who just finished architecture school and he'll kick you out of the job because he wants his daughter to do the project. Or he has a really good friend who charges less than you do and he gets the job. But if you're advising him as a business strategy to then do the architecture, he has you in every decision that he's making. And we've, we've seen that. No, we've worked two times with Nestle. This is the third time we're going to work with Liverpool. We're working for Coca-Cola in Mexico. So we're starting to work with companies that, that understand that what we provide is contemporary thinking. Not only that we like uh, to experiment and explore with architecture, of course, we, we, we thrill and we love doing architecture, but it's the whole adrenaline of bringing the clients and growing with them to do the architecture that we want to do. Huh? <laughs> the other question was about Dubai. What about Dubai? Um, um. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to talk that much anymore. What was, I, 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 I love. They're not, yeah, they're not happening. We've, Antonio and me have gone to Dubai, how many times? Three times. Um, I mean, they had great enthusiastic spirit to do things, but they did it the wrong way. <laughs> they, they, they kind of, uh, I mean, we've all know the stories. We, there, there's books about it, no? Even uh, Oma did a really uh, big uh, criticism in one of the Biennales, no? But uh, it was kind of this innocent thinking, no? Why don't we hire this guy to do help us with the palm? And then the palm didn't work, no? And then, well, now we're going to do, no? And Shiksayed Road is, I don't know how many kilometers, no? Or, they're, or doing all the buildings. And then, well, where are the workers going to be? People coming from India to work in these magnificent buildings or from different parts of the world. And where are you going to see the people that really work in these buildings? And then, they, no, starting to do some other cities. So it got, I think, we still need to see the outcome, no? What will happen out of the learning? Is there a learning? Because, of course, I mean, they proved, they, they proved to have money to do it. 
But another lesson out of economics, no, that it's not about the money. It's about what can really happen if you have uh, the power and the will and the money to do it. No? We, had, we haven't gone back again. And uh, out of the projects that I know, um, I mean, you have the Abu Dhabi project, uh, uh, the racetrack no, by uh, Asim Todd, and uh, who else? There's a couple of buildings that were, were built, but nothing more compared to what, was hap what is happening in China, for instance. No, But... Um, I don't know. I, I hope that there is a learning out of that. We haven't gone back. Maybe one more question. Um, uh, for me, cinema has always been a very big influence for all the things that I, I guess because of the the cinematic experience is very similar to the way you approach architecture and like sequence of spaces and all that. Uh, but I was wondering in your case, even since you started as a musician, uh, how has that influenced your design? And when did you switch? Did you switch if you left one or if you still do both or how is that? Well, I, um, I'm incredibly grateful that I was a musician. I'm incredibly grateful that I didn't listen to society telling me that you had to do one thing and focus and do it right. I'm really grateful that my parents didn't listen when they told them that I had ADD and they didn't put, give me medicine. <laughs> um, I think I started learning the lesson from there. When um, I, have a, a, I had great parents, no, my father passed away last year, but he's, uh, he was a science, National Science Prize in Mexico, a great scientist. My mom, uh, she still lives and she's incredibly, um, she's been a great mother, really spiritual. She went to the India to look for her guru and so she has like the perfect uh, advice at the perfect moment and uh, she would say, do whatever you want but have options in your life because you never know what's going to happen. And that was really way back before we knew all the these natural disasters and crisis, economical and, and pff, and I said, well, okay. So, um, I, um, well, the only thing she said, do as many things as you like, but do them well. And if you're going to be a drummer, I expect you to be a good drummer. And if you're going to be an architect, I expect you to be a good architect. So those are the things that your parents say that you, they get stuck somewhere, no? And I started playing the drums, and I didn't know I was going to be a professional drummer, and we got signed by a major company. And um, I decided to stay in school. It was the first semester of architecture that then I was... Uh, inviting all my colleagues to my concerts because we were recently signed with Virgin Records. And, um, but the experience and the provocation of being a musician while being an architect, I understood that there was no suit for the architect. That It was not something that you put on and you say, okay, now nine to five, I'll think as the architect. Uh, you pack all the experiences of your life and, and they show in everything that you do. So uh, I remember even having stuff designed for school or for a project, and I would get stuck and I would throw the pencil out and rip papers and leave for a, a concert somewhere in Latin America or the States. And sitting down in the drums while I was thinking of some other thing, I would get it and I would say, it doesn't stop there. So I would grab a piece of paper and just scribble something, go back and, and start drawing. So I, I found it easy that when I was sitting down as a musician, it really provoked or pushed me to do things that I would maybe not have done if I was this monothematic architecture who only saw life through architect glasses, no? So it was about life experiences. When I stopped playing music at some point, because um, to answer a little bit specifically the question, I won't go longer, uh, I knew that I didn't want to be a drummer for all my life. I didn't see myself playing on a stage at 60 or 70, I mean, w worst case scenarios for my friends as musicians, they become producers or they become the directors of some uh, m music company, no? So I said, well, it, it's good for a while. I was doing it from 18 to 20 something, which was pff, the best time in your life that you can be in a band. And, uh, and then it was like, okay, what well, architecture is something that I want to grow with and I want to grow old with and I want to learn from the experience. And um, when I quit music, uh, I felt the lack, uh, I was lacking something and I went to New York to study film. I, I did a, a, an intensive course of uh, film because I love cinema. And, uh, and I started 
understanding that I didn't want to read only about architecture and I didn't want to see only architectural books, that most of the, most, most of the better or more interesting ideas came out of having a beer with, with a friend or being with my wife sitting down or, or, or even with my daughter. That is, I mean, overwhelming, the experience or trying to see the world through her eyes. It's like, how boring do we get when we grow old, no? We should, we should be kids again, no? As we grow old, instead of really taking things so seriously or irresponsible. So, um, um, I know I'm going to be doing architecture for the rest of my life, and I know I'm going to be doing more things on top of that. So, all the layers, I think, add, no? And um, that's, that's the, at, at least the way I see it. It's a life experience, no? Michelle. Okay. Thank you very much. No. Okay.